Um, but tonight we are in the book of Zechariah. We finished Nehemiah last time and we're jumping to Zechariah, which is like 50 years back or so. Uh, so if you don't know where Zechariah is, it's on page 498. Uh, but if you're still lost, find the book of Matthew, first book of the New Testament. That should be easy to find. Go back. One book is Malachi. One book before that, Zechariah. Uh, so, so go ahead and do that now. Um, before we start with Zechariah, I want to talk about, talk about uh, my kids for a second because I always like talking about my kids and because I can. So my kids often want me to watch them, right? They say, Dad, look at this. Dad, look at this. And so I watch them, and they do like some kind of jump half spin thing, and they think it's the most amazing thing in the world. And, and really, I, I watch my kids a lot, and I watch them for two reasons. Either I'm watching them to, to catch something good or to catch something bad, right? Those are the two reasons I watch my kids. I want to see them do something that's, that's abnormally cute, and wonderful, uh, I like watching the oldest one read. The youngest one is just learning how to walk, so I'm always watching, just trying to catch that first step. Um, and so you're, I'm always watching my kids, trying to, trying to catch them doing something good, but then there are times I see that look in their eye where they're up to mischief. They're trying to do something that they know they shouldn't, so then I watch them to catch them doing something bad, not because I want to punish them, but because I want them to learn the difference between good and bad. And sometimes my kids are like, watch me, watch me. And sometimes they look at me like, oh, you're still there. I remember when uh, my oldest was little, uh, learning to, to use the potty. Uh, I, I, I'd help him get in there, and I'd walk away for something. And he'd yell it after me because he didn't want to be alone. He says, I don't need primacy. I don't need primacy. Because at that age, that innocence, he always wanted his father there. He always wanted me there. And then as he gets older and he starts to try to be sneaky about something, then he like, you know, looks at me and, 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 and he gets that smile like, oh, I was going to do it, but I, got, I would get caught, so I'm going to wait till later. Uh, and the thing is, like, I want to watch him all the time. I watch them as much as I can. But you know what? God's always watching us. Uh, and, and, and sometimes he reminds us that he's watching us. Sometimes I remind my kids, you know, hey, I'm watching you. And sometimes they, they ask if I'm watching. It's like, are you watching this? Watch this, Dad. And then I, and I, I turn to look because uh, I want to see them do this amazing thing, even if it's just like a little half circle jump. Because for them, that's all they can do. It's amazing. Well, God sent Zechariah, his prophet, to remind them that he is watching them, that he still cares, that he is not some far off God who takes vacations or takes naps. He is involved in his people, and he had just brought them back to the land. Zechariah existed uh, back in the first, uh, the first group of people that come back to the land. If you remember back when we studied Ezra, uh, when Zerubbabel led about 50,000 people back to the land, he was one of them. Uh, I think it was like 42-something. But uh, So Zechariah was there. Zechariah's name means God remembers or Yahweh remembers. Uh, if you want to be more accurate. So if you are named Zach or Zachary, that comes from Zechariah, your name means God remembers. Uh, and he does. He never forgets. So let's take a look at verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. That is the word that God has for Zechariah. If I was Zechariah and I got that word, it's like, okay, start with the Lord's been very angry with your fathers. I'm like, oh, can we start with something happy and kind of work our way down to that? Uh, but no, God doesn't like to pull punches. He doesn't like to, to, to say things just to make us feel better. He wants to get down to the truth. So yes, he was very angry with your fathers. Then he goes on and says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Notice how the Lord of hosts is used three times in that sentence. It's like God wants to say, Hey, I am the Lord of the armies. I am the commander of the armies of heaven. You have to realize who I am when I'm talking to you. And sometimes my, my kids forget who I am. I tell them something and they think it's a suggestion. It's like, no, I told you to do this. And I have to remind them, I am your dad. I'm your father. And I told you to do it. You need to do it right now. And then they, then I, as soon as I bring that card out, like, okay. And then they go and do it uh, because they realize that, that authority I have as their father and as, as their dad. Uh, and we need to remember that God is God over us. He's God. He has ultimate authority. No one has higher authority than God. What God says goes. No asking for a second opinion. 
no trying to get mom to go against dad, which is what, you know, kids try to do uh, until they realize it doesn't work very well. But we can't do that with the Lord because he alone is God. And so whatever he says, go. And he's been angry with their fathers. because um, Well, but then he's, he didn't say why, but we know why, because they follow false gods. But then he says, return to me and I will return to you. He says, I want to have this relationship with you. Stop doing the bad stuff. Uh, a lot of Christians like to tell people to repent nowadays. Repent, repent from your ways. And that's great, except nobody except for Christians know what it means. It's not a word we use out in the street. We don't walk around saying, oh, I forgot my, my phone at home. I better repent and go home and get it. You know, we say, I got I to go home. I got to turn around. And so, so it might be better for us to say, instead of repenting, just say, hey, stop doing the bad stuff. Start doing the good stuff. Start walking for the Lord. Start trusting him. Start, start being a Christian. And people ask, well, what's being a Christian like? Or they might, they might have an idea of what being a Christian is. like, no, I don't want to be one of those guys. Those guys are crazy. Well, then he's like, well, why do you think Christians are crazy? Why, what, what behaviors have you seen that you're like, oh, this is it? Because I, I could probably tell you those probably aren't Christian behaviors. Those could be Christian people just doing non-Christian things. And that's happened for a long time. Take, take a look at history. We have the Crusades. Uh, we have... We have the, Inquisi- the Spanish Inquisition. Those are horrible things that people have called, who have called themselves Christians have done in the name of Christ, yet they are opposed to everything Christ is and everything Christ stands for. And we don't know that if we don't know who Christ is. If we don't read the Bible ourselves to understand Jesus Christ, and that's the whole Bible because we're going to talk a lot about Jesus in this book. Uh, if we don't read the whole Bible to find out who Jesus is, then, then, we, then our picture of him is not complete. We think he's different than he is. And there have been a lot of people who I've had opinions about, but once I met them and talked to them, I realized that my opinions are wrong. And you have to realize that so many people today uh, think of Jesus and they have opinions of Jesus that aren't true because they haven't met him and they haven't talked to him to realize that they are false. And you, my brothers and sisters, are the ones who get to bring Jesus to them. The way they act with you and the way they think of you is ultimately going to be the way they think of Jesus Christ. So take that responsibility to heart and and represent him rightly. Zechariah continues to say in verse 4, Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds, but they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So he's telling them, says, hey, your fathers didn't obey me. I warned them. I sent prophets to them. They didn't listen. And he says, but where are your fathers now? And the answer is, well, they're in the grave. They're dead. Where are those prophets? They're dead too, probably killed by the fathers. You know, it's just like that, that, it's like, well, they're dead, they're dead. And then but the Lord says, my word is still here. And the thing is, if the Lord doesn't come back to rapture us soon, I'm going to be dead someday. And you know what's going to last longer than me? The word of God. The word of God will always be true. No matter who's preaching it or if nobody's preaching it, it will still be true. If every copy of the scripture is, is found and burned, which I don't think God would allow, but if it was, it would still be true and everything he says in it is still right. No matter if anybody knows it or if anybody's saying it, God's still there. He doesn't exist because of us. We exist because of him. Verse 7 says, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Sabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. And it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses red, sorrel, and white. Okay, so as we get into this next section, the first section is a standard, hey, repent. And then from seven, for the next few chapters, he's going to describe eight visions to us that he got all in the same night, this 24th day of the 11th month, um, and, and, and he gets these visions. It says he saw at night, which, you know, some people think maybe it's a dream. Some people argue that's not a dream, it's a vision. Uh, and, and the truth is, I don't care. 
If it's a dream, if it's a vision, I don't care what it is. What I do know is it's the word of the Lord that God gave to Zechariah, and that's what's important. We like to argue over details that aren't important. Um, but but the, let's take a look at this vision. It's about this guy who's on a horse, right, this red horse. Uh, and, he's, and, and he's amongst the myrtle trees in the hollow, which is a low point. So red horses in, in prophecy, uh, in scripture, are usually uh, horses of war, because red's the color of blood, and horses are an animal that you would use in wartime. Um, and and the, the myrtle tree represents Israel. It's, a, it's kind of a shrub, really. It doesn't get like over eight feet tall. Um, and then I hear it's really, it smells beautiful when it's crushed, which speaks of Israel every time it's crushed. It, 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 it has a sweet aroma to it because uh, God takes care of his people. And, and I, I looked up myrtle tree because I'm not a tree guy. And then uh, showing pictures of crepe myrtles. And I'm like, oh yeah, crepe myrtles. We got a ton of those around here because those are myrtle trees, you know, with the breakfast food wrapped around it. And so we got those trees around here. It's not that big of a tree. If I was, if I was a, a person and I'm going to be represented by a tree, I don't think I'd pick that tree. I'd pick a big one like a redwood or something. But God says, nope, they're a myrtle tree. Um, and they're not that, and it's, and it's in the valley, so it's nice and low, uh, because probably because Israel's in a hard time right now. And behind this guy in the red horse, there's a bunch of other horses, different colors, red, sorrel, which is kind of a mixture of colors, um, and, then, and then white. Verse 9, then I, this is Zechariah, said, my Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said, I will show you what they are. So in this vision, and usually in visions, uh, they have a little guide. They have, well, a little guide. It's probably a big, scary guide. They have an angel guide that, says, that, that kind of shows them around because, you know, you can't just have the Apostle John or Zechariah walking through the future or whatever. So, you know, they have an angel that, that kind of brings them around and explains things to them. So that's what this one does. Uh, he says, what are these things? Um, and then, so the angel who talked with me said to him, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. You know, whenever I see to and fro throughout the earth, I think of the beginning of Job. Uh, I don't know if you think that too. Uh, I'd ask you, but you're not here, so you can't answer me. Uh, so yeah, Job, in, in the beginning of Job, Satan came up to, to, to God and God said, where have you been? He's like, oh, I'm wandering to and fro throughout the earth. And so you can imagine just like an angel, uh, either Satan or, or one of these angels, just kind of going back and forth, looking around, seeing what they can see. And so, so really what these guys are doing is they're giving report to, to this head angel here, this angel of the Lord in verse 11, uh, who, whom we believe to be Jesus Christ. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro throughout the earth and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Doesn't that sound nice? He, it sounds nice. It's like, okay, there's Jesus there, the angel of the Lord. And the reason we think that's Jesus is because lots of times in the Old Testament where we see angel of the Lord, uh, it speaks about Jesus uh, in, uh, in the pre-incarnate, like this is before he came to earth as a baby. Uh, he still shows up sometimes. We know for sure we see him in Joshua. Um, and the reason we know, we, we, can see him, we, we know that's him is because Joshua worships him. And he accepts it. He doesn't say, no, don't worship me. Because when John tries to worship an angel in the book of Revelation, the angel stops him and says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, but the one in Joshua accepts it. Uh, and, and, and Jesus is the only angel who can accept worship because the rest of them don't want to go the way of Satan. Uh, who, and Satan would accept worship as well. He tried to get Jesus to worship him. didn't work, though. Um, and then, so whenever we see angel of the Lord, we think it's Jesus Christ. And I'm not, like some people are so confident and they say, oh, it has to be him. And I'm thinking, well, I'm probably him. I don't really know. But then again, that's not the important thing. What is this vision and what does it mean? Uh, it says, all the earth is resting quietly. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, oh, the Lord of, Ho oh, Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah? against which you were angry these 70 years. And the Lord answered the angel who said to me, who talked with me and good, with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, but they helped, but with evil intent. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and the surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities again shall pros- will spread throughout prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will choose Jerusalem. So those are good words, and they're wonderful things for the people to hear that Zechariah says. But before we get to that, let's back up and talk about this, this vision itself. So he sees the man on the horse, the red horse, as a symbol of war. He's a man of war. The other horses that come up to him, they're reporting to him. We've been around. Everything is rest, resting. The earth is peaceful right now. And, and, the, and the angel of the Lord, whom we believe to be Jesus, is, is not happy with that. It's like they shouldn't be resting. And, and my interpretation of that, of, of uh, 14, 15, 16, is that Jesus says, hey, I was punishing the children of Israel. I was correcting them, and I was using these guys to do it. But I gave them a little power, and they went overboard, and they are oppressing my people, and I'm angry with them. And now they are at peace. They are the evil people who seem to be getting away with it. Uh, and, and so we could feel that God's planning something, that God has a plan here. He's watching everything that's going on, and, and he's, and he's going he's gonna to make it right. And the thing is, that's what happens in our lives too, because a lot of times we, we get taken advantage of, right? We're like, I'm a nice person. It seems like nice guys always come in last because everybody always steps on us and takes advantage of us and cuts in front of us and does all that thing. And we're like, okay, fine, I'm nice, and we'll back off a little bit because we feel it's not worth getting into. And, 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 and that's good. That's what we should do. But then sometimes we start to feel like I'm too nice. Uh, people take advantage of me too much. And, and I'm, I'm not speaking up for myself. And, and I, would, I would ask you, when did Jesus speak up for himself? When he was taken to the cross, they said, just come on down if you're the son of God. And he didn't do a thing. He let them do it. And I'm not saying that we should just let people step all over us. What I am saying, though, is, is I don't think there's such a thing as too nice. I think if we can be as nice as Jesus, I think that's really good, and we should do that. And, and I don't think we can get past Jesus to be too nice. Uh, what, what I am saying is, is that we, we have to realize that it's not fair in this world, and it was never meant to be fair. And, and no one ever said that this world, well, I guess someone probably said it, but no one who really knew anything said that, it, that this world's supposed to be fair because it's not. It never has been fair. But I'll tell you a secret. It's not fair in our favor. If it was fair, I would die for my sins. If it was fair, I would not go to heaven after I died. And when it, if it was fair, I would be going to hell to pay for all the sins for, for, my, for my rejection of the Lord for the first half of my life. I would be paying for that. But that's not fair because Jesus died on that cross. He didn't deserve to die. I deserve to die, but he died. And, and his payment covers me in my life. That's not fair. It's not fair in my favor. And if we realize that it's not about what's fair, it's about what's right. And what's right is that when we sin, that sin needs to be paid for. So it gets paid for and paid for by Jesus on the cross. And what's right is if he pays for, for my sin, he deserves my life. He deserves my devotion. He deserves every second, every moment from now until eternity, worshiping him and loving him because he, he saved me from hell. Like That's the, the best I could do for him, and it's still not enough in my opinion. And so we can't argue and complain about what's fair and what's not fair because life is not fair. And it's not fair in our favor. The, the things that we have to deal with in this life when people are being mean to us, they are so small and insignificant compared to the things that Jesus has done for us, the blessings that he has given us. And why should we let go of those blessings so that we can grab onto these small irritations and be angry about them and lose track of the wonderful blessings of Jesus Christ? We're doing it to ourselves, brothers and sisters. We need to keep our eyes focused on him. And every irritation that comes our way is an obstacle we have to step over, step around, walk through, because it's trying to get us to let go of the blessings of God. It's an attack. So just shrug them off. Keep your eyes and your hearts focused on the Lord, and everything will work out.
So the nations had evil intent. They, they, they overstepped what God had instructed them to do when they were dealing with Israel. Therefore, God says he's coming back to Israel and he's going to set it back up and it's going to be bigger and better than before. And the thing is, no other nation in history has come back like Israel's come back. They've been hunted down, sought after, and, and murdered for millennium. And still, they're around. Still, they're strong. They seem to suffer the, they seem to, the, uh, to suffer the greatest of all the nations, and, and they seem to prosper through that suffering, greater than anybody else, them and in the church. When the church is, is persecuted, when the church suffers, the church grows. When the, when the Jews are persecuted, the Jews suffer, they, they grow and they, they, be, they do really well. Just like a generation or two later, they do amazing because God blesses them. He keeps an eye on them. He watches them just like he watches us. He watches us to catch us something, doing something good and he watches us to catch us doing bad things. The bad things, not so he could point us and laugh so he could punish us, but so he could correct us so that we learn not to do the bad things in the future. And the good, he watches us do good things so that he can give us praise and he can give us honor and he can give us rewards for the good stuff that we do. When my, when my sons do something wonderful, I tell them, I'm so proud of you. You did, that, you did a great job. And they get so happy in their hearts that I said that. I don't even have to give them ice cream. But sometimes I give them ice cream because I like it when they're happy. Um, and so, so God's choosing Jerusalem just like I choose my children day after day after day. And I'm always watching them, wanting to see what they're going to do next. Verse 18 says, Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. So now we're into the second vision. We'll only get the two of them tonight. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? And I probably asked the same thing. If I was with an angel and things were happening, even if I thought I knew what it was, I would still ask, what's going on here? Because what if I'm wrong? And I just maybe want to hear the angel talk some more. Uh, so he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So the people of, the people of God, these horns have scattered them. Horns usually uh, represent um, Gentile nations. So nations that aren't Jewish, like the Babylonians, like the Medo-Persians, like, like the, uh, the Gre Grecians, the Greeks, uh, the Romans. Um, and some people think these horns uh, are like Egypt and Assyria because at the time Zechariah is doing his prophecy, the, um, the Medo-Persians are in power, so the Greeks and the Romans have not yet come. Um, but they will come, and they will come in force. Um, and then verse 21 says, And I said, what are... Oh, sorry. Verse 20 says, the Lord showed, Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. Uh, then I said, what are, what are these coming to do? So he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out uh, the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So here the craftsmen are coming. There are horns there that oppress the, the Israelites, and the craftsmen are there to, 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 to overcome the oppressors. Uh, and that, that happens over and over again throughout history. He's got four here in this, and if you want me to match up each horn to a country, I don't know if I could. Uh, there are different, different people thinking that they mean different countries, um, and, and the point is I don't care. I, I don't feel like I need to match everything up because the point of prophecy is to give a message, and that message clearly in, the, in chapter 1 is that there is hope. There is hope for the people of Israel. Uh, when, we see the, when we see the war, the war horses, uh, the message here, because remember, these people are just coming back to rebuild the temple. Uh, and and, and the, the message is, hey, God sees what they have done. And he is not happy about it. He is going to, to increase Jerusalem. So that would have been an encouragement to the people. They're like, okay, well, we know we, we have not been treated nicely. We know things are hard. The enemies are all around us trying to get to us. So at least we know that God's on our side. And then the second one, the four horns that scatter people. These are clearly the enemies of God, depending on which country you want to put it. It's always the enemy of God. And God is sending four craftsmen to upset them, to overturn them, to scatter them like they try to scatter us. Um, and, and, and looking back at all history, did God do that? Yes, he did. The Jews were first enslaved by Egypt. God rescues them from Egypt. 
Then they, when we go into the period of Judges, they are oppressed by the Philistines or the Moabites or, or, they're always, or the Midianites. Or there's always another group oppressing them because they kept forgetting God. They kept leaving God. And, and God would let another country come in and, and they would do their worst to Israel. And then God would raise up a judge once they turn their eyes back to God and says, help us. He would raise up a judge and he would kick them out. So there would always be somebody who took care of the problem. And then as we get into the kingdom age, they get all haughty again. Uh, and then Assyria comes in and takes out the northern, the northern uh, tribe of Israel or the northern kingdom of Israel. And God sends Babylon to take out Assyria. And then Babylon's oppressing Israel. They take out the southern half. They're not treating Israel well. Well, the Medes and the Persians take out Babylon. Later on, after Zechariah comes, the Babylonians are, treat, are treating Israel bad again. Their Greeks come in and take out the Medo-Persians. Then the Romans come in and take out the Greeks. Then Rome just kind of falls apart on its own. There's no big invading force that comes and takes over Rome. It just gets so big and, and so corrupt that it falls apart. And eventually Rome, the, the city gets invaded in, in about 500 AD, uh, a thousand years after Zechariah. Um, and then according to, according to the book of Revelation, Rome's going to rise again. And some people are trying to figure out, well, what, what's Rome? Is the United States Rome? Is the European Union Rome? Um, I got a radical idea. I think Rome is Rome. I, I think the Bible like names things by name. And later on, that great city of Babylon, people are trying to figure out if it's New York or if it's Rome. I think there's going to be a city called Babylon, and I think that's going to be Babylon. And if I'm wrong, well, then at least I will be accused of just believing the scriptures, and that's not so bad, right? But, but I'm thinking that God's going to do what he says he's going to do, and if he says he's going to do something, we don't need to figure out this is this, this is that. I think we really just need to look for the heart of the message. What can we learn from what is being taught to apply to our lives today? And the message he has here for them is the same message I believe he has here for us. God is watching when people treat us wrongly, and he will make it right. And every time that his people are oppressed, every time that his people are taken advantage of, he will raise up somebody to bring the other nation down. I didn't finish my history lesson, uh, but I was going to say when the Jews were, were, were being, you know, murdered in the Holocaust uh, during World War II by the Nazis, uh, America was that craftsman. We came in, and, and Russia as well, we came in and stopped them. Um, but but to, our, to our hurt, when the Jews needed a place to go, we, we didn't say, come to America, we'll, we'll take care of you. We're like, no, send them back where they came from. And that's how we started the land of Israel again. The United Nations actually got together, fi figured out where the Jews came from, which was the land of Israel. Then they sent them back to Israel, which at the time was controlled by Britain. And they're like, yeah, they can have it. I, I don't think there's a country with a, a more legal right to their land than Israel, um, not to mention a godly right. But, but yeah, look at the history of that. And if you don't like it, well, uh, talk to God about that because he's the one who set that up. I didn't do that at all. Uh, but, but going back to the point of, of our passage, what is it that God wants to speak to you? He's watching. He's going to take care of you. And, and the things that were like, it's not fair, this shouldn't happen to me, uh, they're nothing compared to what's happened to other Christians, to Jesus Christ himself. And we need to get our eyes off of ourselves and realize it's not about us. It's not about how comfy our lives are. It's not about how much money we have or how, how much security we have. If our security isn't Jesus Christ, then we've got nothing else. Because I know no matter what happens to me in this life, even if it's the most horrible thing you and I can imagine, I still get to go to heaven in the end. And that's enough. And if, it's, if that's not enough, nothing else will be enough. That has to be enough. We have to, to, to reroute our brains to realize that all we need in life is Jesus. Everything else, we praise the Lord for the extra blessings, but that's what they are, extra blessings. There are things that we need to honor and thank God for and be thankful for, but we need to realize that they're temporary. God's going to take all that away someday. The clothes I have, the money I have, the vehicles I drive, none of that's coming with me to heaven. The only thing that's coming with me to heaven is, is, is was my relationship with the Lord, my relationship with other people who love the Lord. And that's it. So talk to your family members, talk to your friends. God wants them to come into the kingdom, and he could be sending you to go do it. This time you get to be Zechariah. 
telling them the vision that you have from the Lord, that, you want, that, that he wants them and he loves them and he's watching out over them, but he's also watching them. Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the prophet Zechariah. That he loves you, Lord, and is speaking your truth to the nations. According to scholars, he was a young man when he started. And a young prophet talking to an older population would be difficult, to be taken seriously. But he starts it out saying the word of the Lord, the Lord of hosts. He comes in your authority and in your power. And Lord, as we go out to share with our brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, parents, family members, let it be in your strength and in your power, Lord, that you would give us the right words at the right time and that you would keep us from speaking foolishness. I pray, Lord, thinking that you are watching, praying that I would live a life constantly of watch this, God, watch this, I'm doing this for you and I want to do this for you instead of trying to hide my shame from you, Lord. Let me open up and, be, and offer it to you, saying, here, take this away from me. I don't want it anymore. So that I could be full and free following you, Jesus. And if there's anyone out there tonight who has not yet given their life to Christ, this is the night, this is the time, September 2nd, 2020, you can have a new life. And everything that you're worried about, you can stop worrying about it if you give your life to Jesus. All you need is him. He will lead you to do the right thing. He will show you what to do with your time and your energy and your money so that it will be worth it to you later on. And he's the only one who can bring you to heaven. Nobody else can, no matter how hard they try. If that's you, pray this simple prayer with me. Jesus, I believe I have sinned. And the punishment for sin is death. But you, Jesus, died on that cross to save me from that death so that I could be yours forever. So Jesus, I accept that gift. Please be my God. Let me be your child so that I could be with you forever. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen. And if you prayed that prayer tonight, then welcome to the family. Give us a call, let us know, so we can, so we can rejoice over you, so we can pray with you, that we can help you figure out what to do next. Because you pray the prayer, and then you're like, okay, now what? Well, it helps to have people around to talk to you about it, so give us a call. Talk to your Christian family members, whoever got you to watch this video right now. Talk to them about it and say, okay, now what do I do? And let us show you how to walk with Christ and be blessed all the days of our lives, not because of how good we are, but because of how good he is.